So let's get started. First presentation we're going to have today, or at least the one I'm giving, uh, is how to get that full-time offer by being a star intern, adding the caveat without playing around with bullshit politics or having to kiss your boss's butt. Um, as Annie mentioned, oh, slides aren't moving. There we go. As Annie mentioned, I have worked for a large number of companies over the course of about uh, 17 years. I think I am on 12 companies now, if I count this right. Uh, I've done everything from being a, uh, uh, what is it, like order taker with Walmart where I drove around a big uh, warehouse facility and I picked up boxes and I put them on pallets to being a UX designer. I sold insurance for a little while. I was also a software developer for a little while. Uh, and now I'm a senior product manager with uh, Indigo. In my past life at the Research Park, uh, I've worked for Anheuser-Busch InBev and Syngenta. Unfortunately, I think two companies that aren't having a presence at the Research Park anymore. Uh, in those places, I hired multiple interns that then turned their careers into full-time jobs with those companies, or I supported them to get full-time offers uh, with other companies uh, to further their career. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about how to step up and be a leader, even as an intern, because I think being a leader is, is the number one most important thing you can do to set yourself apart. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about how to have massive impact as an intern. Uh, and then we're going to jump into how, as an intern or just an employee in general, uh, you will be so irresistible that others will beg to work with you on your team. Uh, and so all of these things I'm going to talk about are things that interns can do, but things that very much translate over into uh, the workforce as a full-time employee. And so a lot of the stuff we'll talk about here are things that I also share with uh, people I work with when I mentor and talk with, with people. Uh, so here's some expectations as an intern. You are going to have solid technical skills. All of you, if, if I caught it right, uh, attend the University of Illinois, if not, probably from another very reputable college. Uh, you are at a top tier university for many different disciplines. Your technical skills are most likely going to be quite good and they aren't something that's probably going to be what sets you apart from your other interns. When I've hired people from interns to full-time in the past, the technical skills are not what got that person hired. There's a pretty solid baseline that everyone has within technical skills. It's not what's gonna set them apart. Second, you don't need to be a master of those technical skills, but you need to be willing to learn in advance. So as a college student, you're not gonna be the best programmer that's ever existed. Knowing all of the syntax of a language is different from knowing how to produce logic and write software. So something within that logic and producing software realm is going to take time. You're not going to be a master of this as soon as you graduate. Uh, I thought I was when I graduated and I very quickly learned that I was, I was wrong and, and that was a mistake. Um, so you need to be willing to learn. And you also must be a constant learner. This is an absolute must have in today's world. Uh, either read books, like you can see there's a bookshelf behind me. Uh, I've probably polished off already in June 40 different books. Uh, so you can also look at podcasts or articles online. Just make sure you're, you're pulling from a quality source. Uh, why does this matter? So as an example, my mother and father have both worked at the same company since I was in kindergarten. That's, that's 31 years, okay? As I showed on the slide previously, I have worked for 12 companies in the last 17 years of my life. And at each of these companies, I had to learn new skills, develop something new because I was usually taking a new role that was gonna challenge me. So everything that I knew in the past got me to that point, but it wasn't what was going to separate me to continue going further in my career. So first up, we're gonna talk about how to step up and be a leader even as an intern. Uh, also, if you guys have questions, feel free to throw them into the chats. Uh, happy to take questions during or if it's something I think I'll talk about a little bit later, I might defer it uh, and talk about it or answer those questions at the end. So why do companies care about leadership? Here's why. Because companies and corporations are tired of wasting buttloads of money on having bad managers. So roughly in the course of a year, companies waste over $160 
billion dollars, $160 billion just in turnover through poor employee retention because those employees had poor managers. Uh, I forgot to add this in, but there's another study that shows poor managers or poor leaders show a five to 10% and it could possibly even be more productivity drag across their employees. So if we did some simple math, let's imagine that you are working for a billion dollar company and you have a five to 10% productivity drag, which I would guess is even much higher. But for math purposes, we'll stick with that. That is a 50 to $100 million loss that that company is having every single year through bad management. And so if you written, hopefully I did my math there um, correctly, but if you think about why leadership matters, this boils it down into some exact numbers. But why should you as an intern care about leadership? So this was an article that was published, I think just two days ago. And I picked this one specifically because the headline is, is pretty riveting. And the head headline reads, Microsoft sacks journalists to replace them with robots, right? So essentially they're just replacing certain people with automation. This is happening all of the time. It's happening all of the time. Not just for people who have technical roles, but it's also gonna be happening in the near future. Uh, this is a Gartner report that talks about how we are going to be replacing middle managers with algorithms. And the key word in this is middle managers. We're not talking about leaders, we're talking about middle managers. There's a lot of roles that are going to, going to be replaced through automation in the coming years. And so if you start to separate yourself as someone who has good technical skills, but also someone who is a good leader, you will be able to separate yourself from that normal group who is starting to find their jobs replaced by automation. So why should you care about this? Well, leadership is about going somewhere and taking ownership. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these uh, in a bit. Uh, one of the other great things is you do not have to have management, director, VP, president, whatever in your title to be a leader. Like you don't, you don't have to have people that report to you to be a leader. It's something that you can be regardless of your position. It's something that you choose to be. Third, being a strong leader makes you upwardly mobile immediately. So if you think about what leadership actually is, it is something that, again, it's you're going somewhere, you're taking ownership, you're leading a group of people, you're getting shit done. That, in a side of a corporation, will make you upwardly mobile immediately. Nothing else, the technical skills, some of those things, they're going to wash out because there's going to be a lot of people that you work with that have very solid technical skills. But being a leader and being able to persuade people, getting people to work on projects with you, being able to uh, excite people about a mission and mentor other people, that's gonna separate you from the pack. And this is something you can even do as an intern. Uh, and as a leader, I'll talk more about this, but you will be able to deliver massive impacts on your projects. So one of the great things is leadership is measurable. Uh, a few years ago when I was at Syngenta, this is 2019, so roughly about this time last year, I took a 360 feedback that's offered by the leadership circle. And there's tons of 360 feedback options that you can do. There's even examples if you Google 360 feedback uh, surveys and things along those lines, you can uh, create your own through like a Google survey or survey monkey, but this is the best way for you to understand how you are interacting with your peers. So roughly this time last year, I thought I was doing great. We had an innovation lab, we had quite a few interns, I was hiring more full-timers, more full we were delivering on projects, and we started uh, doing some work with Syngenta about a new, with a new company called the Leadership Circle. Uh, I put this survey out to my peers, uh, people who were, who were above me that I reported to, uh, people that uh, reported to me, and I got the survey back and found out that I was only 41% effective. Uh, this was, this is seriously, like, I still remember getting this survey because I thought I was doing really well and I was on top of the world. Turns out I was real bad. 41% uh, effectiveness was, um, was, was not good. And it was something that did not make me happy. I was, I was actually pretty sad with myself at this point because everything I thought I was doing was, was keeping me ahead and, and I was a good leader for my group. Uh, but turns out 
you can actually work on these things. So in seven months, I redid this survey to uh, the exact same group of people, and I went from a 41% effectiveness to a 94% effectiveness. Uh, in this circle, it's, it's hard to read, but there's different areas within uh, kind of the leadership journey about uh, authenticity, creativity, some of those things, uh, which are, are towards the top of this circle. Uh, that I started to excel in. So if you go back one, you can see where a majority of my stuff towards negativity, where I was very reactive, uh, it was towards the bottom and a majority of my feedback uh, versus creative creativity and, and proactivity. So leadership is about going somewhere and taking ownership. Uh, I want to break this component down because one of the things that that I always struggled with in leadership was uh, I always felt that it was something that you were just kind of born with and it was a natural ability. Uh, you had charisma, some of these things that you could help get people pulled onto a mission that was very similar to where you wanted to go. You could bring people in. But if you weren't taking ownership, then you weren't actually leading people. And so Ownership is, uh, breaking it down, I'll, I'll talk more about this in a second, uh, is you can't do it if you're always blaming other people and expecting perfection. So think about some of the times you've been in a workplace where something goes wrong and you see other people point fingers. Uh, it, this, is not, this is not a great way to work. One, because it sets up uh, a higher ability for failure because no one then actually wants to come to work because they're always getting blamed for uh, bullshit that maybe wasn't their faults or they're blaming other people and then the chain never actually gets any better because it's blame, 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 and you don't actually ever deliver anything. Uh, plus always um, perfection is just is a big myth. Um, so what you have to do is you have to take ownership. As a leader, this is the number one thing. You're not looking to point fingers ever. And I'm going to give you some examples of uh, what that means. So flip through this. So on the left here, we have uh, an employee, we'll call him Bob. Bob asks uh, Timmy on the right to do some work for him. They're on the same team. Bob wrote up a nice email, sent it over to Timmy and expected to get a certain result. Uh, but Bob is telling Timmy that, hey, hey, I, I sent you this stuff, but a bunch of things is wrong. He goes, I don't understand when I give clear directions that you can't even follow them. Now our work is behind and I thought we were on the same team. I guess I'll just go do the work myself and thank you for ruining my weekend. When you have Timmy on the right side, he doesn't understand why he's being yelled at because he received one email that was asking him to do a very complex task. And so the breakdown here is you have blame and you have pointing fingers and you aren't being a good person to be on this team with. And so Timmy is definitely going to hate Bob. I think it was Bob. I'm not sure what name I gave the guy on the left, but I'm sure he is going to have some hate for him and never wants to work with him on a team again. And so even though this may be a somewhat more extreme example, anytime you point fingers in the workplace, you are immediately losing respect of everyone you work with. So as we noticed, that employee took zero ownership. Let's go through a better scenario. So this is the exact same scenario. We're gonna say we have Tommy on the right and um, Billy Bob on the left. Uh, so Tommy is saying, you know, hey man, thanks for spending time getting all this together for the project, but I didn't quite get what I was needed. I don't think my directions were clear and I can see why. Just an email wasn't right for this request and we should have probably talked about it. Do you have time to discuss now? I'd like to walk through the initial email to understand how I can better share results in the future. Um, so if Billy Bob or whoever we have here on the left uh, is excited about this because he, he enjoys working with the guy on the right and, and hoping that they can work together uh, more in the future. But when it looks at an example of, of leadership or uh, as an intern or an employee or just a person in general, again, anytime you point fingers, Pointing the finger at that person, I guarantee you it's not 100% their fault in what happened. There is something that you could have looked internally to do to fix the situation. And so if there was a five-step process that got you to the point of output that you weren't after, I will guarantee you there is something within that five-step process that you as a person most likely messed up that could have helped avoid that negative outcome that you had in the end. So giving uh, another example. So 
In this example, you see the guy on the left, he's screaming so loud that the dude's tie is flying back and he's complaining because, you know, hey, I couldn't get my report done because of Johnny in accounting. He never gives me the data I need, so my report is always late. How can I be expected to get the report done when Johnny is always holding up my data? And so I hope that all of you notice the difference here. Like it, I've made it purposefully not subtle. And these are examples of things that I have uh, not only experienced, but also done in, in my life. Not that I've yelled at someone like that, but I have absolutely pointed fingers at people at, during times when I didn't get something that I was, was expecting. And, and the difference in these employees just isn't minor. It's something that is absolutely career changing. And I would think, I forget how many people we have on the line, 30 or 40 people. Of all of the 30 or 40 people, I would guarantee you, you've been in a project or been in a situation in which someone has pointed the finger at you and you didn't, you didn't truly understand why they were pointing the finger because maybe the guidelines or whatever it was that you got wasn't clear in the beginning. Um, so you have to get this, this mindset shift because other people, even though you feel they are the ones that made the mistakes, they aren't the ones who were fully, um, fully responsible or accountable for what came out at the end. You're working on a team. So anytime that you run into these mistakes and you blame other people, it's not something that's going to get you respected. So how do you go about shifting your mindset? First, people do not trust or respect people who constantly blame others for their issues. Anyone uh, you are in a working group with, or you talk shit about, or you complain about your manager or whatever, all of this comes into blame. Every single thing that you will experience in the workforce or 99% of everything that you experience in the workforce is of your control. Uh, for example, something that would be out of your control if you were working for a company that you currently got laid off due to COVID-19. Some of these things that you can't once businesses start to lose money and need to get rid of people, but a majority of the rest of the things that are happening are within your control. And so whenever you encounter an unexpected problem or result, you need to look inward first. What did I do that got me, that got us to this point of this unexpected result? Uh, so a good example of this is uh, looking at the five whys. Uh, I don't have a slide about this and I'm not gonna talk about it, but if you take note on this, you can Google it afterwards. Uh, the five whys is a, a well-known um, construct in which you can go through to help solve problems. So for example, something breaks, you ask why. Then from that answer, you ask why again, and you do this five times. And through those five times, you usually get to the root cause of a problem. Uh, and this is something that you can do for yourself. So, Yep, reflect on every step you took, seek where you could have improved uh, to change the outcome. I forgot the bullet points that I had going on here and then find ways to improve for next time. So this is the, the most important piece. As an employee or just as a person in general, if things don't go the way you expected and you continue to do those and they continue to not go the way you expect, uh, that's a problem. You need to learn from your mistakes and you need to adjust. And this is something that uh, good leaders try to instill uh, in their employees. So you must have zero, zero blame for others. Uh, look internally first, because as you start to point externally, you're going to immediately lose respect. Uh, so skip that one. Second, uh, you have to have, how to have massive impacts uh, as an intern. And this one is again, uh, something that makes sense for everyone in the workforce. You need to stop doing things that don't make a difference. Uh, I'm pointing this out, uh, but this is something that will take not time to learn. And as an intern, this is what you're uh, working towards. So for an example, um, let me see if I have, yeah. So this may be more towards a, a workforce example, but uh, I will relate it to something that I do kind of every day uh, as well. So First of these, you have three tasks as an employee. Uh, first one is you need to analyze competitors' market share of product X uh, because you need to see if your company is going to launch into competing space. You then need to set up a meeting for 20 people to share out your results from the previous study. And then you need to also attend three result sharing meetings of how colleagues about different product lines and product lines have done research and each of those is an hour and a half each. So in these tasks, 
There is one of them that you should absolutely do. And there is two of them that you should find a better way to do. And so as an example, I'll go through and talk about why uh, these are the way they are. Um, but I have a, a journal that I go through and write down my day. And I write out the days, the tasks that I want to do that are most important. And then I outline the other ones. Anything that doesn't fall under that top task or the two that below it, I don't do. So for example, on... Um, Mondays and Tuesdays and, and past companies I've been, we typically have a, an hour to two hour long uh, full company meeting. I have stopped going to those because they send out notes afterwards and I can read the notes in two to three minutes and I can spend that 55 other minutes that I gained working on something that's going to uh, push the products and stuff that I'm working on in my company forward. So apparently my slide is screwed up. All right, so how you should handle these tasks. Uh, first one is absolutely something that you should do. The second one is something that you could outsource. So for instance, in most companies, there are admin assistants who do just this. They help set up meetings, they help reserve book, they help book meeting space or help do other things. Anytime that I've run across a task where I need to set up a meeting that I know will take me 20 or 30 minutes or even an hour or two, uh, just communicating with people, seeing if they're free, saying, hey, I need you to attend this. I usually will hand it off to someone who knows everyone, who knows the meeting space that will be better, who knows a good time that I should be able to meet that won't conflict with other components, and who can get this done five times faster than me. So not only am I valuing my time, I am also valuing the time of the company. So I get paid X number of dollars, and they're expecting me to do X job. If I then spend time doing things that aren't in line with that job, I'm not really having impact within my role. And so if I were to look at all of the excess meetings that I get invited to that don't provide impact, which is number three here, uh, it says you should attend three result sharing meetings of colleagues about different product lines. Each of these meetings is gonna be an hour and a half each. This is an entire day of work washed out. Eight hours of my day is gone. Um, and so what I would suggest in this scenario is don't go ask for the PowerPoints, review them on your own, and then set up a separate 20 minute meeting if you have questions. And so this is something that took me a while to learn because I always felt that I could have valuable impact and do things within a company by being involved in more things. I felt that I had a lot of knowledge to share and I wanted to be involved with as much stuff as I could so that I could share my knowledge with everyone who was working on these projects. But the thing that I very quickly learned is that the more I spread myself thin, the, little, the less impact I am making. So imagine if, um, let's see if I can think about an example here. So imagine that you're a uh, computer science software engineer and in school, you're going to start learning, uh, let's say Python, but you really, really want to become a good programmer. So you start to learn Python, JavaScript, Java, uh, Perl, let's throw some COBOL in there to get weird. Uh, and then you're gonna learn HTML, CSS, and some other things. You can do all this at once. How good do you think you're going to be in all of those languages that I just mentioned in comparison to where if you devoted six months of your life to becoming an expert within Python? You're going to be infinitely better at Python as a as singular language than you will be if you were to combine your skills and all of those languages in together. And so you need to really think about how you're going to spend your time and how that time is going to have impacts within your internship or your career or uh, whatever else. Um, so a lot of people tell me that this is not easy. Like I have this conversation with a lot of people I work with and I give advice to others and I say, stop doing stuff that doesn't matter. Uh, but the thing is, if you don't value your time, other people won't either. If there's a lot of stuff that I say no to, I probably say no to 90% of the stuff that comes across my plate because when it look, when I look towards the things that I want to achieve, not only in my career and my personal life, I know that those things aren't going to add value. It's not going to create a step change where I go from one to 10. If I add those 90% of other things in, I'm going to go from one to two. I have no desire to go from one to two. I want to go from one to 10 because going from one to 10 separates me from everyone else I work with. And it allows me to achieve my goals of someday uh, having a president or a VP or a chief level job inside of a corporation. And by not focusing on 90% of the stuff, it allows me to achieve that one singular thing that I'm after because that's going to have the biggest impact. 
And if you don't value your time, others won't respect you for it. But if you show you have value for your time, people will respect you. By saying no, it's, it's maybe going to upset someone initially, but it's not going to ruin your career or your engagement with that one person. There are some small caveats that like if the CEO or some chief messages you up and say, you want to have lunch, the answer to that is usually always yes. Uh, but by valuing your time, it's going to free up your day to accomplish things that really matter to you, your team, and your company. All right. So let me get through some of these. All right, so as an example of some of this, as you focus on things that, that truly, truly matter, uh, people in your team are gonna start to seek you out for higher profile projects because they know you can complete stuff. They're not gonna look for the someone or the person who half-assed completed 10 different things because all of those 10 things, like the programming languages, you're going to be mediocre at. You're looking for the one thing that you can truly excel at. And that one thing is something that can change over time. Mine has definitely changed over time where it's gone from, I thought I could be a good UX designer and engineer to my true passion and my uh, focus in the world now is around leadership. Because I think leadership is one of the biggest things that is lacking in most companies. Not only have I seen it firsthand, the numbers are telling me just that. And so I'm having a lot of conversations and a lot of mentoring conversations with people on how they can better stand up and speak out with inside uh, their corporations. And so as you start to truly excel on one big thing, people are going to start to seek you out to help on more big things. And so you can transition from the one big thing you're working on now to a new big thing that gets you higher satisfaction or bigger glory, bigger bonuses, better job, whatever it may be, but you're not going to get there if you try to do 10 different things all at once. So this mindset shift is gonna take time. People are gonna resist your initial changes, that's fine, because people have short memories. Uh, you need to stick to the mission. There's something that you are wanting to accomplish and other people, unless they're a mentor or a boss or something along those lines, they may be able to tell you that you're off track and that you, maybe you should pivot to something different, but people's memories are short and those people who are negative shouldn't have a space in your mind. Um, they will start to notice impact. So they're going to forget uh, about you saying, no, I can't do this. And they're going to really start to notice the impact that you have on the projects that you are um, connected with. So what are some ways that you can get started? Um, I start my day with about 90 minutes of just solid work time. No email, no instant message, no any of those things. I have a task that I want to accomplish for that day. And I'm going to spend roughly 90 minutes working on it. 90 minutes for me, as I've watched myself over time, it's enough to really get a lot of quality work done, but it's not enough to burn me out uh, mentally for the course of the day, which is something that you need to uh, pay attention to. 90 minutes, 60 to 90 minutes is a good spurts for you to work in. Uh, after that, you should take a 15 to 30 minute break, go for a walk, eat some food, exercise, something, uh, but 90 minutes is usually the top before you need to take a break. Um, Turn off all distractions. I can put my phone on silent. I turn off the notifications. I don't want anything distracting me during this time. Uh, I'm answering emails. That's, that's not something I do as I consider work. Me doing work is setting up a new uh, project or designing something or something that is part of my core job, but answering emails and, and interacting with people on Slack or other things, that is not something I consider to really move the needle. So, let me see what I got in this slide. So as you, as I noted earlier, um, you're going to have massive impacts. Uh, just take notes, keep track of where you're going, follow what you see is working well for you, and then stop doing the things that, that aren't. Uh, I recently wrote uh, a LinkedIn write up uh, where I was talking about to-do lists and I was noting that to-do lists aren't valuable. I do not think to-do lists while I keep one, uh, things that are on your to-do list aren't necessarily valuable uh, until you learn what not to do. If you're writing out a to-do list that has 20 or 30 items every day, uh, I would bet that those 20 or 30 items, maybe only 10 to 15, 20% of them are actually valuable and you should stop doing the other components because it's not moving the needle. It's not stepping you up to that next component. So as you take notes, keep track of where you're starting to find your success 
and double down on those areas where you find yourself to be truly talented at something and then start to put and devote more and more effort to those things. Uh, another big component is don't work on the weekends. Uh, don't work more than 40 hours a week. Uh, a lot of people you'll see in industry work 60, 80 hours a week. Uh, I fully believe that that is, is bullshit. Uh, I believe that if you are working 60, 80 hours a week, uh, you are most likely not focusing on things that uh, can really move the needle. You're focusing on too much and you're not actually providing enough value in the world to where you're, you're stepping up uh, and how you are working. So another component, multitasking is real, multi-concentration is a lie. So, so many job descriptions now talk about being able to multitask, to go from one task to another. That's a thing, you can multitask. A great example of this is when I wash the dishes or when I cook, I listen to music. That's multitasking. I'm cooking, washing the dishes and listening to music or walking and chewing gum, that's multitasking. Multi-concentration is not a thing. So if you're listening to this speech right now and also trying to work, you are half-assing both components. You need to fully focus on one thing because you're not gonna get the true value of both things by trying to do two things at once. Multi-concentration does not work. And I also just noticed I have a typo on this side. Damn it. All right, so third, become so irresistible that others beg to work with you. Excuse me, Brandon. Yes. Uh, we have a quick question on the topic yep. that you just discussed. Yes. Uh, Michael asks, what are your thoughts on how to maintain a good work-life balance with all of these things to advance your career? It, with the things that I'm, I'm speaking about, uh, it, it's saying no. Uh, it's really easy to say yes to so many things and get in the trap of working more and more and more. Um, but the more things you say no to and you focus on things that truly matter, it's easy to have that balance. Uh, I, a lot of these things that I'm showing today are things that I've learned and I, I've learned through research and reading and other components. Um, but in my past life, I was the one who blamed others and worked 60, 80 hours a week because I thought that's how you got ahead. Um, but I, I also realized that I was half-assing so much stuff that now I've focused on becoming really good at that one thing. And that one thing is what consumes most of my time and even my off work time uh, as I'm taking a walk or something, new ideas pop into my head around that one thing because I'm not trying to do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and it's just about setting that boundary and realizing within yourself how many hours is enough. Some people that I know only work 20 to 30 hours a week. I know I have some few friends that work five hours a week because they've focused so much time and effort into that one thing. That one thing is paying extreme dividends to them that they can afford to work five to 10 hours a week. Uh, it just depends on you as a person and how you want to kind of pivot. Uh, if that doesn't answer the question, feel free um, to, to push something out there and clarify again. Uh, for some reason, I don't see the chat box up. There we go. All right, cool. So third one I'm gonna talk about, and I'll go through this a little bit quick so we can have uh, some time at the end for questions and answers. Um, becoming so irresistible that others beg to work with you. Uh, I know that this uh, kind of item sounds a little intense or a little, um, I, don't, I don't know what word I'm looking for. It doesn't seem real right? But it, it very much is. Um, you're probably thinking, um, I'm not charismatic. People are gonna wanna, aren't going to want to work with me, or I'm an introvert. Um, you know, there's, people aren't going to beg to work with me. It's, just, it's not who I am. People aren't excited about uh, working on teams with me. Uh, but there's a trick. Empathy is what will start to separate you as a leader and, and as, a, as a teammate that will separate you from the others on your team. So empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Uh, another great way to say it is seeing with the eyes of another, listening with the ears of another, and feeling with the heart of another. So not only will empathy help you be better connected to your coworkers, it's also going to help you get a lot more stuff done in your career. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, so empathy, it's easy to get confused with sympathy. Sympathy is feeling pity or feelings of pity and sorrow for someone else's misfortune. This graphic shows a good example of how to be sympathetic versus empathetic. Sympathetic is saying, oh, I'm sorry, your toy is broken. Empathetic is helping someone fix their toy that is broken, but also feeling the pain that they have for that toy being broken. So 
how does empathy help? Empathy helps through negotiation, effective teamwork, it creates trust, creates better products, better meeting outcomes, and helps with teaching others. And as a leader, and again, when I say leader, this doesn't mean manager, director, VP, president, whatever. It means as a leader. As an intern, you can be a leader. As a first year employee, you can be a leader. As a non-employee or someone in your community, you can be a leader. You don't have to have a title. Titles don't matter. So you spend time listening to others. You take care of the people and help them feel heard. You help them make a difference, which means you pull them into the team, you help them move on, uh, and you help show compassion. Um, and you persist. You continue moving forward with the items that matter to you. So apparently this slide is also screwed up. There we go. How to be there for someone at work. So how do you show empathy at work and how do you practice this? Uh, first, you need to ditch the tech. I know this is a little bit tough now because you can't really be in person, but I do not believe, and even though there's a ton of studies coming out that say people are gonna work from home, I do not believe that is going to work as long-term as what people hope because people need other people and you need to have a connection. The best way to get work done is to create a relationship with people and through empathy, you can do that. Uh, truly listen to the person, which means you listen to everything that comes out of their mouth before you respond. You don't start thinking of answers while they're talking. You wait till everything comes out of their mouth. Then you craft your response and then you res respond. As an introvert, sometimes talking with people is a struggle for me because uh, one, I'm maybe not totally interested in the conversation, uh, but I found a great trick uh, from Chris Voss. He wrote a book uh, called Never Split the Difference. He calls it mirroring. And it's a great thing I do when I get into new conversations with people to learn more about them and then find that middle ground on, on where we can start to truly relate and truly have a conversation. Uh, but within mirroring, a great way to do this in a first time conversation or just with anyone, I dare you all to try this and you will be astounded at how well it works. When you're talking with someone, when they finish their sentence, repeat the last three words. So for example, let's say, um, Jenny was going to say, Hey, I'm going to go running after work. I'm like, Oh, running after work. And then she's going to continue and continue and continue. And you can start to have a conversation by continually asking questions. And it's something that people are going to start to take notice because you're really listening to them. Everyone likes to talk about themselves. Everyone does. And so as you start to ask more and more questions, people will start to open up. You start to create a personal connection. Through that personal connection, you can then expand how you work together at work and you can really start to have that massive impact. Having massive impact by yourself is going to be a struggle. You're gonna need people there alongside you and with you to help. And so through empathy and through listening and talking and connecting with people, you're gonna be able to form that team to where you're really gonna be able to get some stuff done. Uh, I mentioned this before, stop multitasking is bullshit. Um, turn off notifications, minimize apps, be present when you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. Don't be on your computer having conversations with other people, checking emails, whatever. Um, I put out a different other video on LinkedIn. Uh, I think I called it uh, to stop being a Zoom asshole uh, because I noticed that I did it, but I also I had uh, a struggle with other people doing it. Um, I really, really resented when I was in a one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, because I know I used to do this in the past and I found out how much it sucks when people started doing it to me. Um, a new email would come in, I would say there's a fire and so I would leave our one-on-one -on -one conversation and come back. In that one action, especially as a manager, you make the people you work with feel like shit. If you are not listening to them, holding eye contact, having a conversation and that there's something else on your mind that's important, it tells that person that whatever you're thinking about or whatever you're doing is more important than that person. Right? Nothing that you're doing at work is more important than another physical human being. You need to get over whatever other concentration you have and truly connect with people. And by asking questions and by being present, you will create relationships that will be able to not only help you more as a person through friendships and other things, you'll be able to get more stuff done at work and have that impact that you're hoping for. Smile, that's another big one. Um, again, not doing the above is disrespectful. Uh, just talked about that. Should have read ahead of my slides a little bit. Empathy can also help you get work done. So we went back to this example where the dude was yelling so loud, the tie was waving. Uh, I'll try to wrap this up two minutes, but guess what? This is Jeff from accounting. Um, he's just trying to be helpful, but he can't keep up. Uh, two people from his department recently left the company, so he's overworked. 
Um, other people in my department could compile that data too. He's not sure why he's the one that has to do it. Um, he just wishes he wasn't nice. He could say no sometimes. Um, pretty sure his boss is constantly micromanaging him. Uh, no one gets him. He's really lonely some days. No one wants to talk to him at work. Uh, and he has a baby due in two weeks. And so while you're yelling about Jeff and accounting, maybe stop pointing fingers, go talk to Jeff, figure out what's going on in his world and see how you can help. So take the time to truly listen to Jeff. He's under a lot more stress just helping with your report. Uh, he's getting more pressure from this boss than the average employee. By listening to Jeff, you can understand his problems and find ways to support his work. And then just be a human. So by listening and getting to know people, you'll be able to better navigate conversations, challenges, negotiations, and do higher quality work. And as a byproduct, you'll just be a better person, which will gain you more respect. Uh, so by putting all these three things together I talked about today, uh, will allow you to have massive impact in your internship. Um, but I mentioned before, why do you need to have impact? Because anyone can just show up. Uh, if you want to succeed, you need to have impact in what you do. Anyone can just show up and do work Everyone has the technical skills. You're all coming from a top tier university. Uh, and I can promise you that the skills you are learning are way more uh, expensive and better than the skills that I learned from my university because it, it wasn't as top tier. So everyone that you're competing with from your university has the technical skills. Any one of them can show up, program, manage, do businessy stuff, data science, whatever. Anybody can do it, right? Some may be able to do it slightly better than others, but that slightly better than others is not going to separate you from other employees and getting that full-time job or stepping up and getting more in your career and what you're hoping for, but being a leader will. And it doesn't take a lot of extra effort in your day-to-day -to, -day to be a really good leader. So that is all that I have. Any questions out there? Apollonia asks, Brandon, I'm curious, what are your top three favorite books on leadership? So this is the number one favorite book. It is called Leadership Strategy and Tactics by Jocko Willink. Um, big favorite book. My other favorite one of his is ex um, Extreme Ownership. And there's a new one that I've been reading. It's called um, What got you here won't get you there um i forget who the author is on that one because i just started listening to it the other day uh looks like it's by marshall goldsmith so basically anything by jocko willink huge fan huge fan Was there any other questions um, I missed? That's a, so other question out there from Johnny at Cargill uh, about taking ownerships. What would you do if your team members still fail to deliver what they promised? Uh, so thinking about it, uh, one of the examples I took out here, uh, every company I've worked in, Indigo is, is not as global as others. Uh, a great example that, that I've had uh, in the past was I was working on a project and I forgot to account for in the timeline a foreign holiday. So we were working with a bunch of uh, people from India. Uh, they promised they would deliver um, X. Uh, they forgot to note in that time frame of X that there was a uh, countrywide holiday that was going to have them off for two days at the end of the week. Uh, so that delayed our timeline. So even though they promised X, uh, what I still missed and them saying, hey, I could do X, Y, and Z by this time, I missed that there was still a company or a countrywide holiday out there. Uh, so it was on me, again, trying to look internally, what could I have done? I could have questioned them better to say, hey, um, we are uh, hoping to push for this deadline. We're going to release X. Uh, is there anything else in your way that could stop you from doing this versus just blindly saying, okay, cool. I'm glad you're going to deliver X on X date. Uh, so again, it's more about looking at what can I control to help uh, shift that conversation to make sure I'm getting, getting what I need. 
Um, and then again, going back to if they're not delivering what they promise, uh, you just hold them accountable, but start to look at, okay, we were going to deliver X, Y, and Z by X date, uh, and you didn't, why are we not doing this? So start asking the five whys and just going through that uh, scenario to figure out what was that broke down throughout that process. Uh, what advice do you have for interns or students who are struggling to figure out what they truly want to do as a career in the future? Uh, so if I were to go back to my slide where I shifted jobs, uh, a lot of times I shifted jobs, it wasn't because I disliked the people I worked with. Uh, it was primarily because I disliked what I was doing. Um, it's absolutely okay to, to spend time guessing and, and figuring out what you want to do. Um, over, over your life. Uh, at some point in time, I found something. It took me 16, 17 years. I tried something new and new and new uh, to where leadership was that, that thing that I got excited about. Like, I, I enjoy going to work and I enjoy building product, but I do not enjoy building product as much as I enjoy building up other people. Uh, so in my previous role, I had a team of, of 26 full-time people uh, between Chicago and India and some people in Europe. And in that team, I got to mentor everyone and took people from a uh, first year programmer to a tech lead that had 15, 20 years more experience than I did uh, and mentor them to, to understand how they can be leaders and how they can upskill their careers and, and do more with, with their time. Uh, so it took me some time, uh, took me some time to get there. Jack has a question. You talked about not regarding email as work. Is that a failure inherent to the medium or is it a failing in the usage of email? Uh, rephrase, is there a good way to use email provided it doesn't displace one-on-one -on -one conversations? That is a great question. So in my example there, uh, I gave it as uh, an intern or a mid-level employee or like a lower level employee. One-on-one -on -one communications uh, and meetings have done correctly are much, much better than, than endless email loops because regardless of the size of the company you work in, I worked in companies of five people or worked in companies of, I don't know, however big State Farm is, 40,000 people. Communication is always the number one problem. So there's a lot that can get left out when you're starting to um, put information in text versus when you meet in person. There's a lot of things that you can do. So as I'm saying this, I'm, I'm pushing that you shouldn't put a lot of your daily effort into email. It should be put towards active tasks or meeting with people to move the needle. Email is not necessarily going to be something that's going to move the needle for you. Uh, but within that, the higher up you go in an organization, sometimes email is a great way to communicate. So it really depends on the situation and how you're using uh, the medium. So uh, I think the last one we had State Farm. I'm totally gonna fail at pronouncing your name, so apologize, I'm not gonna do it. Um, how would you react to an unfriendly email or message or if someone starts blaming you for something harshly, just like in one of your previous examples? Um, so one of the things I, I learned in the new book that I was reading, uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, uh, is about taking uh, criticism or blame or even uh, taking someone giving you praise. Uh, the number one answer for, for those examples is to just say thank you because that ends the conversation. Uh, the example that he used in the book, he was saying that he, uh, he went to a dinner party and his wife complimented uh, another lady at the dinner party's dress and said, hey, I really like your dress. And the person replied back and said, oh, this old thing, you know, this is not my favorite. I have many other dresses uh, like this. Uh, in that scenario, if you think about it, on the surface, it doesn't look too complicated. But by not just saying thank you, what you've done is you've taken that compliment and put it back on the person and said, you don't know anything about me. This dress is dull. This dress is stupid. Why do you even like it? Right? And so by saying thank you, it allows you the opportunity to just defuse a ton of situations. And so where that may have happened, you can say thank you, end the conversation, and then find ways to either repair that relationship in other manners or stop working with that person. 
but I wouldn't recommend coming back and, and trying to defend yourself. Just saying, thank you, end it, be done with it, because it's probably not worth your time to, to argue. All right, I think that was the last question. Jenny, Annie, yes. is there anything else to add? Yes, thank you very much for that. Uh, Brandon, that was a great talk.